Thank you, Chairman. Uh, I've had apologies from councillors Jed Hall, Peter Martin, Chris Storey, Ross Welland, Liz Wheatley, and from Alan Binfield from the Tenants Panel. And we have Councillor Blagden attending as a substitute. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. I've had declarations from uh, yourself um, in respect of agenda item 15, the national um, non -dis national non domestic rates discretionary rate relief policy. Um, your uh, chairman is chair of the Chantry's Community Association and trustee of 40 Degrees, uh, both organisations of which uh, re receive discretionary relief. And uh, the vice chairman is a trustee of Godalming Museum Trust, uh, which is also an organisation which receives discretionary rate relief. Do we have any questions by members of the public under Procedure Rule 10? None, Chairman. Thank you. Uh, we now move on to Committee Work Programme Item 5, and this is contained on pages 9 to 14. You've now, as usual, I will assume you have all read your papers before tonight. Um, so if we move to page 9, you will see there what we have down as the committee work programme. Now this can change at any time, so if members feel desperately that there is an item which falls within our orbit that they want to put on the work programme, they may do so. <clears throat> Anybody got anything about the work programme or can I move on to the next item? Move on. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, the recommendation is to note its current work programme and agree any additional items. We don't have any at the moment, so is that agreed? Agreed. Thank you. Review of the overview and scrutiny terms of reference and arrangements. Um, this is quite a new committee we have met. You will see a very brief note there um, because this is one of those subjects where we're gathering knowledge, we're gathering information. And the subcommittee is, in fact, going on some training to look at scrutiny in early, ne next week. I think it's Thursday of this week, actually. Um, so it's just a very quick note to say we are working on it, and you will see from the work programme when we're bringing it back to you. So is that noted? Thank you very much indeed. Local authority trading companies and new income sources. That's on pages 15 to 22. Graham. Thank you, Chairman. Um, Chairman, at the last meeting of the committee, um, members asked for a scoping report to come forward on these two subjects. And um, since that uh, meeting, I did meet with um, Councillor Bolton to uh, talk about um, Councillor Bolton's ideas on the subject. Um, what I've set out in this report, Chairman, is um, uh, the, the two issues separated. So on page 15, start talking about new income sources. Um, there's some quite helpful guidance produced by SIPFA, which is the um, Chartered Institute of Public Finance and Accountancy, um, on, it's called a practical guide to local authorities on income generation. Um, not very exciting title, but it's a really helpful guide to... Um, the, the sort of areas where local authorities are restricted and where local authorities have got some freedoms and flexibilities to explore new areas of income. Um, I mean, I, I was pleased that members recognised it uh, as being an area that we did need to look at because we do have a budget shortfall uh, coming into next year's budget and, and beyond in anticipation of the uh, Chancellor being quite tough on local government tomorrow in his comprehensive spending review. We do need to do all we can uh, to close our budget um, shortfall, and uh, Peter has a report later on the agenda which uh, expands on that. Um, Chairman, on page 16 of, of the agenda, um, I've set out, just because this is a scoping report, I've just set out some of the um, restrictions, some of the freedoms, and also some of the factors to consider when looking at new areas of income. What, what we're doing at the moment that is an important stage of the budget process uh, that, that we do in November, which is to meet with all the heads of service, hear their um, thoughts and ideas on how they can um, make savings, uh, improve their services, and also uh, increase income. 
Um, that is the piece of work that will feed through to both ONS committees in January in a lot of detail. So how I've left that particular item in this um, report, Chairman, is to ask uh, members to identify any areas, in, uh, any specific areas that they would like officers to have a look at uh, in the overall review. And then we will go away and do that and then come back to a, uh, a future meeting, I think we've said in March uh, next year, uh, with a bit more information on that. Uh, Chairman, just turning to the second item um, within here, which starts on page 17, which is about local authority trading companies. Again, there's a um, fair bit of literature around on this. Certainly our external auditors, Grant Thornton, have produced some guidance on it. Um, and there are some long-standing and some relatively new examples in local authorities up and down the country, mainly larger authorities, uh, unitaries uh, and counties who have um, benefited from economies of scale and they uh, trade and have done for some time with other local authorities under a company framework. Um, not too many examples of district and borough council um, sized authorities uh, getting into the local authority trading, but it, it's definitely something that authorities are looking at. Um, what, what we put in the annexes, um, uh, Chairman, I've worked with our legal team to set out in Annex 1 um, what we can actually do within our own powers because local authorities do have quite um, wide-reaching powers. I think to sort of make a, a fairly sort of broad distinction, any, anything that involves a profit or um, making an investment, a purchase or trading purely for profit rather than for undertaking the normal functions of a council, we would probably need a company to do that through. Um, but most other things we can actually do ourselves uh, anyway uh, under our existing powers. So um, in Annex 2 on page 21, uh, we've set out some examples of uh, council uh, tra trading companies that exist at the moment, again, just to give um, members uh, you know, a flavour of what's out there. But there's, there's an awful lot more literature around. And again, because this is a scoping report, you know, really keen to hear any um, specific ideas from members of the committee, Chairman, that we can go away and have a look at and report back in more detail. Thank you, Chairman. Indeed, that's, that's excellent. Um, Councillor Bolton. Bolton. Thank you. You have obviously met with officers. Is there anything you'd like to add? Or yes, some thank proposals? you, Madam Chairman. Thank you. I wonder how we can best... Um, answer the question thank you for the report by the way but valuable report i welcome the report could you speak into your microphone yes please? i wonder how we can thank you for the report i wonder how we can best answer the question uh, on the top of page 19 how we can identify new income sources because um, i suspect that some of us perhaps new newer members of the council would be a little hesitant at saying exactly what we could or couldn't do. I wonder whether we shouldn't have a small group, subcommittee, to meet perhaps once of all interested parties who would then collectively agree possible new income sources. Councillor, are you proposing that we set up a small subcommittee of this committee to look at this and on a task and finish basis? Yes, because it seems to me that that would be the best way of answering, of identifying new income sources. Otherwise, the alternative would seem to be that each member interested would come up with their own ideas and forward them to, to you. I am very happy, councillors, if either way. Um, but if individual members have any particular ideas, I am very happy they should discuss them directly with Graham so that we can get this thing moving. So if, Councillor Bolton, you've got ideas, please discuss them directly, and the same with any other member. But if you wish to meet informally, 
as a group to discuss your ideas, that would be fine. The problem we have is that we don't have much time <coughs> and we have to get the, under our constitution, we have to get the executive to agree to us setting up a group <coughs> um, at this moment in time, I might add. Um, so it does seem to me that if you wish to meet informally and come up with some ideas, and I'm sure um, Graham would be only too pleased to meet with your informal group or an informal group and look at those proposals. Would you agree? Chairman, more, more than happy to. And, um, and this is a, quite a widely researched area. And to say this, this, this book is a good starting point, there's a lot of literature there that I can share with members or discuss with members and, you know, informally um, and, and see whether that um, you know, tr sort of triggers some, some thought process around this. Because we don't, we don't necessarily have to implement the outcome of this exercise by the 1st of April. I mean, this, we, we have a, a budget shortfall projected for the next four years, um, in each of the next four years. So this is a longer term piece of work as well. Um, so it, I'm not, we don't necessarily have to sort of rush ahead, but I, I, I think you're right, Chairman. I think we, we could probably start with an informal discussion with any members that are interested. I can facilitate that and show members what we we can do, can't do, and do do at the moment, um, and see whether any ideas come out of that discussion that we can bring forward in the, in the review that we come back to members with. For any other thoughts from members? Yes. Chairman, it, it seems to me that the, the, this process during the Star Chamber process would be something that the question would be asked of all departments and heads of, of groups. You know, is there any way you can think of of raising more money from what you do, and that, so that we can consider it? But I mean, I think the idea of today is is, and I don't think any of us would be upset, particularly with new members, to to come up with wacky ideas of, of how you think you could raise some money. There's no reason why it's got to be totally researched and, and, and effective at this moment. If any members today have got ideas of, of how we could raise money, you know, selling Waverley T-shirts or whatever, um, you know, we could raise substantial money. Um, I, I would have thought just mentioning it now to, to Graham is uh, would be would be fine. At least Graham can say, well, actually, we're not allowed to do that, or that's something which we could look into. Um, I, I think I, I'm always in favour of, you know, nothing is stupid, and, and let's let's come up with anything you can think of, because presumably when this was put on the agenda for us to research it, members had some ideas of how they think they could raise some money from another source, and, and let's share that. Sooner, sooner rather than later. Thank you. Councillors, do you favour this idea of an informal group that talks directly with the finance people um, and then we can formalise it? Would you agree with that? And this is not a subcommittee. We're not breaking the rules. It's just a group of members getting together and helping out. Could I ask you to lead on that, Councillor Bolton? Thank you. But I will liaise with Graham. Yes, please do. I was just checking. I really was allowed. In which case, I put the recommendation that members of corporate consider the details set out in the report and identify. And what we've done is we've agreed to put forward an informal group to talk with the officers so that we can progress it. Thank you. Chairman, sorry, could I, could I just check, does that cover both items in here? Because we've got the trading company I think I issue as well. Would, would we pick that up in as part of the same process? The trading companies, would you pick that up at the same? Yes, my understanding is we do actually have a, a, dis, a defunct or dormant trading company, do we not? I think so that was we could resurrect disbanded. that. Okay, I leave it with you to talk with the officers to cover both parts of this and to report back. Thank you. Are we all agreed on that? Thank you very much indeed. Uh, Louise? 
Six month progress report on service plans. Thank you, Chairman. Um, members are aware that service plans set out are an important sort of exposition of the business plans of each of the service areas under the remit of this, uh, of this committee. Um, this report um, sets out the six months progress against the plans that you will have seen in your Janu uh, January joint ONS um, committee where the draft plans were presented to you. These, uh, this is an important opportunity for you, as part of our performance management um, framework, to monitor progress against the service plans, against the actions, the things we said we were going to do, have we done them? So, on, starting on page 25, you'll see at the top of that report that we have what we call rag-rated the, the different actions. So, green, for example, will mean that the action is on target to be achieved at the end of the year, or in some cases has already been achieved. Um, I think it's a very positive picture, um, uh, Chairman. Uh, we have done a lot so far in this year, um, and pretty much everything is on target to be completed. Happy to take comments. Um, if there's any detailed comments about the particular service areas, I'm sure my colleagues will help me out. Thank you. I don't think you'll need any help, Louise. Um, <laughs> Councillor Goodrich. Thank you, Madam Chairman. I think it's, uh, it's great to see so many green dots everywhere. Um, which rather begs the question as to, and there are an awful lot of items here, and for those councillors who weren't here last January, the service plan evening, which is for joint ONS, is a fairly um, interesting evening. Um, all the heads of agreement, head, all the heads um, come up with their service plans pages and pages of it. They're all time restricted to, I think, six minutes presentation and four minutes questions, and we go on for a couple of hours. It seems to me that a lot of the things that are on these service plans are things that are ongoing. So, for example, if you take page 26, um, you know, time scale is variable, progress to date ongoing, 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 ongoing. It seems to me that it would be a more interesting service plan evening if we dealt with new items uh, that, are, that, that are coming forward with specific dates. And although the heads of, de of department may well have their ongoing stuff, I don't really think the members need to be involved with that. And, we, and it would not be, for example, Necessary. If a service head had actually nothing new to go and was just going to be ongoing with, with the services that are provided in that department, that's fine. That shouldn't be. Uh, you shouldn't have a goal to see if you can produce more targets and service plans than, than one's colleague. And therefore, I think the January meeting would be more meaningful if we just had new items with specific dates uh, to deal with. Um, so that when, in a year's time, when we look at this plan, it will be a quarter of the number of the pages and a little bit more meaningful than this, which is an awful lot of stuff, which is happens every year and, and, and so on. So I just wondered, because and, and, I appreciate for performance review and everything, head of department need to have all the things they want to do in the year and be judged against it, but whether we could have the distilled bit only relating to new plans, which I think would would mean that some service departments might might be speaking for two or three times the amount of time they speak have spoken hitherto, but because they've got lots of new things that, that they want to tell us about. I just wondered whether, from the officer's point of view, that would be practical or whether members think that that would be helpful. I'm appreciating that quite a lot of the members here haven't had to go through a service plan evening yet. Thank you. Anybody got any comment on that? I think Mike was quite right, actually. We discussed this earlier. and uh, For example, we've done a lot of work on mirrors. I want to see something quite specific in the service plans as to how we're going to hold them to account. You know, there are things like that that we can scrutinise by the fact that they've identified them as important issues to go in a service plan. 
and we can actually call them forward to our committee if we wish to. So I think it makes it more meaningful for, for all of us, although the officers may find it a bit difficult. What do we all think? Yes, Pete. sorry, Pete. Sorry, Madam Chair. Very good idea. I mean, uh, I look at some of these uh, green stars or green circles and think, underway, no completion date as yet. Green. What's it mean? It, you know, it, I'd rather have something positive, and uh, you mentioned mirrors, and I think we will be talking about them shortly. So, uh, a fine example, I think. But I agree with uh, Councillor Goodrich. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Um, what I've come across, and forgive me, this is only a personal experience, but what I've come across RAG analyses, it's to expose risk and issue. And I think this is at the point. The management plan gets signed off at the beginning of the year. That's how the council anticipates it will manage the services. What occurs during the year are um, risks and issues, and it's those that bring the, uh, the, the business that needs to be dealt with, uh, identified, um, managed and dealt with, and signed off. And I think that would, uh, that approach, if that makes sense, would, would um, solve the, the problem we're looking at here. The officers, is what we're requesting achievable? Um, Louise? Okay, sorry, uh, sorry, Chair. It's all right. <laughs> I know you're trying to call past the buck, but never mind. Let's come back to you. Oh, okay. <laughs> Rob, Robin's going to say something as well. Um, I, I, I welcome the, the, the comments, Chairman. I mean, anything to make your lives easier. I mean, it, it is a, a monitoring report, so I do think it's a chance for you to, to critically assess what we're doing. Um, and if you want to, if, if you want to sort of distill it, as, as Councillor Goodrich was saying, then I'm very happy for that to happen. It does make our lives easier in January if we have less things to talk about. Certainly, um, I think Robin will mention something about. Do you just want to concentrate on new items? Because, I mean, as part of your scrutiny role, you may be interested in, in some of the day-to-day -day business, or you may want to focus that at <coughs> certain times of the year in, in particular meetings on certain service areas. I mean, it's, it's really, you know, up for debate. Thank you. Robin, do you want to make a comment? Thank you, Chairman. I mean, I agree that these, these service plans could be tightened up, and I think part of what you're experiencing here is, you know, when we're monitoring the service plans, because they're not tight enough, perhaps not smart enough, then actually that, that's what you're feeling. I would sound a note of caution about only looking at new things because actually if you, if you think about that three years ahead, if we think that's the right system, you're only looking at what's new this year and, and the majority of what heads of service are responsible for delivering perhaps might be not within your, the gaze of your scrutiny. So I, I do think these could be tightened up. I do think they could be smarter and I agree with the suggestion that somehow the monitoring needs to pick up on exceptions on risks and issues during the year. But I, I, I think there are issues with just looking at what's new this year, although perhaps if we could restructure the, the joint approach so that the focus is on what's new this year, but without losing any sight of what's also ongoing. I, I think the word important comes into this. I am just looking at an amber one here, which is CNO slash 16, briefing plan for January, not that one, sorry, 015, Website to be updated in November 2015. Okay, so we're at the end of November. Where are we? I, I, it's, it's in amber, but there needs to be more of a comment. But that is an important issue. It's not an ongoing. It's something, as, a, as was said earlier, at one time we looked at projects that we were doing, uh, and that formed part of the service plan. And I think we need to go back to that and say what is in here, which is an important project, which in fact we haven't completed, do we stand a chance of completing it? And only, and I'm a great believer in setting targets we can achieve, not setting targets for the sake of it. So could I ask officers to go away and think about what we've asked? <coughs> if they require more clarification, Michael and I are very happy to come in and talk about it so that we know the direction of travel. But if I may, might make the point, we said this in January, guys. 
We're not just saying it. In January, we had the same thing when we had this joint meeting. And we said, look, you know, we're trying to outdo each other on the number of points that we put down here. This isn't what we're looking for. And I think you'll get more out of it as officers, more challenges this way, and we will be able to scrutinise more. Yes, certainly. Thank you, Madam Chairman. And if I can amplify what uh, Councillor Frost has just said, um, looking at this, I am at a loss to understand what you wish me, as a member of this committee who is here to support you and make our collective work better, I'm unclear as to what behaviour you want to see driven within me by this report. And I'd be grateful if, that, if, that, if you can drive my behaviour and use this report to do so, or to reshape it so that it does drive effort and behaviour. Thank, Thank you very much, Councillor. Well, we do have a joint meeting in January where we're going to be looking at the plan, so you haven't got long to redo these. Um, but can I leave it with you? If you've got a problem, come back to the Chairman and Vice Chairman and we'll be, try to be very helpful to you. Is that agreed by members that we actually rethink this? Are we all in that same frame of mind? Thank you. <clears throat> Anything else you want to say about the service plans? Yes, Councillor Thank Fraser. you, Madam Chair. Um, just four, I hope, constructive comments. Um, all of them on policy and governance section, I'm afraid. Page number? <laughs> page number, PG3 on page number 31 is the first one. Concerning the um, induction events. 51? Page 31. Yeah, thank you. Um, there were 19 induction events. I think I attended 18 of them. They were all very good. Well, 16 of them were. Two of them, I think, could be improved. One was very much too short to warrant the journey from the nether regions of Waverley to attend, but that's a, a small matter. The other one was uh, a substitution of the Surrey County Council roads engineers, which needed a heavy dose of black coffee to accompany it, and I wonder whether that could be improved if it's ever thought to repeat it. Um, otherwise, I think you should be congratulated on the induction programme. I found it very useful indeed. The second point I'd like to raise is on the page 32 under PG7 where you say there's a high quality internal legal advice provided to council elected members if only needed to ask for this once in the last five, six months where I ask for a legal comment upon the EU habitats legislation for areas of special protection and the monitoring thereof, and the SANG legislation that follows with it, uh, and the monitoring of that. Um, my question is, I didn't get it because Mr. Matthew Evans, head of planning, said that it couldn't be done. End of subject. Page 33. Um, the new citizens panel will receive their first survey in November under PG14. Have they done that? A rhetorical question. I think you probably wouldn't know at the moment, but I hope they have. And on page 34, um, your Waverley publicity document, which has been issued as an alternative to making waves. Um, it hasn't been greeted with great acclaim, I regret to tell you. The people I've spoken to about it, they think it's too obviously a propaganda vehicle. I leapt to its defence, of course. But I do think it can be improved quite considerably. I hope they're constructive comments, Madam Chair. Councillor Fraser, if you think something can be improved, could I suggest you send an email, etc., to uh, Robin <coughs> with the ideas as to how it can be improved? Um, but I don't think your choice of language in talking about propaganda is appreciated. So I would be grateful if you would 
look at your choice of language sometimes in, in how you're commenting. Um, on the issue of uh, Matthew Evans, um, have you got that answer or have you asked the legal department that question? Madam Chair, I was in discussion with Matthew and he said he didn't think it was necessary and wouldn't be easy to arrange and that was to leave it. Councillor Fraser, if you wish to have this information and you believe it is part of the legal department's duty to give it to you, then I suggest again you, email, write, yes. you write to the legal department and ask them um, because that is the item we're talking about here. Um, Louise, could I please ask you to talk about the citizens' panel? Thank you, Chairman. Um, yes, the citizens' panel survey has gone out um, in the last two weeks. Good. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you, Chairman. Um, I note that uh, PG13 is marked as on target, even though graduate recruitment is listed as unsuccessful. Uh, it's excellent to notice uh, to note that the apprentice recruitment's on target. It's really important. But I would have thought that our failure to attract graduates into the organisation is worrying for our long-term ability to fill um, our more, more demanding roles and probably should be flagged up. I don't know, perhaps the officers would care to comment on that. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. Yes, I mean, so far, uh, prior to this year, we've, we've had a very good track record of attracting um, graduates into the council. We have not completed that so far this year. We haven't yet finished, and our aim is still, and we think that we still can get a graduate in for this year, although generally the graduates would start in September, and that's when the first round of them do come in. The, the drop-dead deadline for getting a graduate into the organisation is actually January, and our discussions with the LGA have suggested that we should be able to do that via a local recruitment process, and that's what we're planning to do. I can't tell you that it definitely will work, but um, that's certainly still our intention, is that we will fill the graduate position for this year. But um, in terms of it being, whether it's green or amber, yes, perhaps, that's a fair point, it could be amber, um, because there, there has, we haven't had as smooth as recruitment as we generally have, but I'm hoping that we will still meet our targets on graduate recruitment. Anybody else? Peter, sorry. Councillor Ishwood. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Um, I'm just going to make the point that graduate recruitment in Surrey in many areas is difficult, partly due to the cost of uh, housing, a comment I was making with Louise earlier on, that uh, it is difficult to recruit in lots of areas around Surrey. Then, in which case, if I may, any of the officers want to come back in, are you all right? Yes. Just, just to say on Councillor Fraser's point, in terms of the induction event, um, you know, whilst I appreciate that you're sparing blushes, perhaps, in not saying which of the induction events was too short, it would be useful for officers to know specifically which one you thought was too short. So either if you tell me now or tell me separately later, and I'll, I'll make sure that feedback's considered when we plan the next one. Madam Chair, it would be another email. Yes, um, and in fact, Councillor Fraser, you're a relatively new member, and the experienced members will, in fact, they will already have sent emails backwards and forwards saying we don't like this, or rather than waiting for a committee, because that way we can get on with it. Okay? Madam Chair, I'd like you to uh, also mention that I was 16. Thank yous and well done's. Good. In my list. Excellent. The recommendation is corporate overview is requested to consider the progress report and to make any observations to the executive. I think we've done that, so our observations will go on to the executive. Performance management report, quarter two, uh, Lara McKenzie. Lara, over to you. Thank you, Chairman. <clears throat> uh, the performance report for quarter two outturn uh, shows the months from July through to September. Uh, generally, performance has been good and on target. The housing indicators have been through the Housing Improvement sub Subcommittee for scrutiny, and the minutes are contained at Agenda uh, Item 11 uh, to be discussed later. Um, the areas we'd like to point to is, is obviously the voids data, which is covered in the Housing Improvement Subcommittee minutes and detailed explanations thereof. The other area 
um, of, of weakness is, is still around the benefits indicators, and that is our processing of housing benefit and council tax. Um, and for this item, I'd like to direct myself to demonstrate to Peter Vickers, Head of Finance, to discuss the issue with the benefits um, and also the remedial action being taken. Thank you. Peter. Thank you, Chairman. I'll just say a little bit about this. On page 53, we've got the two indicators, NI 181A and B. Um, a is uh, new claims and the targets uh, processing within 20 days. And uh, the other one, 181B, is the new uh, change of event target, which is um, in nine days. Um, so the good news on that is that uh, looking um, this week, the... Um, so literally to, to the end of October, we've got um, the new claims days down to 21 days processing, considering uh, when we looked last it was 34 on the graph here. And um, it's nine days now for the um, change of events. So there's a bit of a story to tell about this. If you recall at the last uh, scrutiny, we were talking about the... Um, uh, recruitment issues going on in, in the benefits department, but also uh, in, from a capacity point of view. Um, this, this has been a steady build-up due to um, some changes around government emphasis on chasing um, fraud and error within the system. And we're using um, some data matching techniques um, that are provided by uh, the government. So effectively we're, we're matching claimants' um, income information against uh, what the uh, HMRC, the, the tax authority, and the Department of Works and Pensions um, hold against our own databases, and that's creating um, changes in circumstances. Now, if you look at the uh, statistics for the last two years, um, we've gone from just short of 16,000 changes in circumstances a year to um, just over 26,000. That's a phenomenal increase in work for the team to deal with. Um, so we began the year, um, this year, um, in January, with um, 1,300 pieces of outstanding work that needed to um, be investigated and reworked through individual claimants' um, files. We're now down to 300 pieces of work. Um, so it's a, it's a phenomenal effort by the team to turn things around. But obviously one of the, um, the outcomes of that means that some of the processing days were obviously slowed down in, in the meantime whilst we were playing catch-up. So we've been through the summer and people have had the holidays and we've had some changes in the team itself. Some people have left and have recruited. It's natural turnover. Um, so we're now back up to... Um, a full staff complement and that's reflected in the numbers that you're seeing on the page now but obviously going forward we have got a challenge to deal with through the increased capacity um, the, um, the increased challenge against the capacity the team's got to deal with the, the changes in the fraud and error investigation that the government's putting on us and um, you know the team are striving to find ways to deal with, with these challenges going forward Thank you very much indeed. Any observations you want to come back? Could you give me some information about F3? Percentage of invoices paid within 30 days. We've talked about this before, but we seem to be in an amber still. It's Certainly, on Chairman. page 54. Sure, I'm familiar with it. Thank you, Chairman. Um, we've, moved the, um, we've, we've moved the review from... Um, monthly to weekly so we're more, much more now on top of the the overall processing of invoices and we, we've got a chasing process in place to, to make sure we catch up so we should see that coming back into line again thank you very much indeed anybody else want to make any comment on the performance management report yes sir thank you madam chairman uh it's the one i'm interested in is the other one on page 53 uh, the one, one at the bottom I must congratulate the Finance Department on superb results of overachieving <laughs> and getting council taxpayers to pay in advance. How do you do it? <laughs> but supplementary to that is presumably this applies not just to Waverley's share of the council tax, but also Surrey County Councils and the local Please. parish councils. And the police. 
I beg your pardon. And the police preset. And I beg your pardon. And the police. And presumably we are collecting all these different councils' monies in advance. Do we have to pay this over? Do we sit on this money? Do we earn interest on this money? Could you roughly quantify how much is at stake? Thank you. Can I just say that if Waverley was to sit on this money for too long, I think your parish councils, as well as Surrey County Council, would have some observations to make. Uh, it is possible, Madam Chairman, that they wouldn't know. Thank you, Chairman. Um, so th th the simple answer is this, is that at the beginning of the year in January, for the forward uh, financial year, we, we do a, an assessment on the collection fund where the monies are paid into, and we share that assessment with the um, preceptors, uh, predominantly police and, and county, and we, we project forward how much they expect to, to receive. And obviously, they, they tell us what they need for the following year, and then we set a payment plan up with them. So we pay them in tranches, tranches throughout the year as a set amount um, for, for the precept and also a, um, an adjustment for the um, under or over collection uh, balance on the collection from, from previous year. Um, so the, in, in answer to are we sitting on the money, well, no, because we've already agreed what we're going to pay. So the, the money's coming in, obviously, we reflect in our treasury management, which we'll look at later on in terms of the interest earned. But um, in, in terms of um, are, are we getting money in advance, um, it's, it's not quite like that when you look at it in terms of the volumes, to be fair. It's, it's a, you're looking at quarters here, and um, we, we try to get people to pay as soon as. Obviously, it's our advantage to do that. And the big um, emphasis is to get people onto direct debit, because the more people are on direct debit, the more guarantee we, we get the money, and it's, it's regular, it's less chasing to be done. So hopefully that answers the question. I think on balance that says no. <laughs> that we are not sitting on money and we're not earning interest on that money. Unfortunately. Councillor Goodridge. Thank you very much. Uh, Peter Vickers mentioned about the um, housing benefit and I fully appreciate you know, the problems that the department's had. Um, one always thinks if, if the government are expecting us to do more work than we were having to do hitherto, and I'm thinking of the fraud investigation which is now being put in as part of the housing benefit uh, um, dealing with new claims, should we be increasing the target? In other words, easing it slightly. I'm, I'm loath to change targets because um, it'll just take the pressure off but one's got to be realistic and I, and I just wonder whether Peter feels that it, it's something we should look at if, if we are being expected to do more within the same time scale as we were being having to do before. Um, thank you Chairman. The, the, um, I suppose the answer to that is that um, if, if we release the target to make it um, easier in terms of processing, the, the, the downside of that is that the, the people in need of the money actually will be the people suffering and it, it's not really fair on them to, um, to be carrying the burden of something that the government's imposing upon us. So the challenge for the team and, and myself is to find a way of um, either maintaining the processing days within target or actually reducing that going forward. In, in, in the aims of helping out the people that actually need the money. So it Thank you, Madam Chairman. I'm sure you're going to tell me I should know the answer anyway, but a fair number of people surely pay their uh, council tax by direct debit over a monthly basis, and therefore month 10 you've finished and you get a tax, or you get a tax holiday in... Uh, was it February and March? Therefore, the money is already in, surely. Or do you pay the police in the lump sum before? And sorry. No, thank you. The, um, we now offer, uh, a year ago we started this, we offer a, uh, people the opportunity to pay in 12s. So it's monthly, 
they don't have to do the 10 month payment plan so obviously that that's changed the uh, the profile of the income generally across the year um so in terms of what we pay to to the police and county that that literally is based on the precept that they they're asked for that they've asked for, for that year obviously there's an adjustment coming year end in terms of um we collect 99% um, and and it, the the the, pre, the amount we precept obviously is a judgment; it's an estimate. So the, there's always a, um, a follow-up adjustment following year and an adjustment to how much we pay. Um, but it, it's a set amount that we agree with them, and we we don't vary that over the course of the year, depending on the collection rates in year. Thank you. Um. Thank you, Chairman. The, the, there's another angle to this, which is that. Um, we employ the staff that collect council tax and our budget pays for them. Um, the county and the police don't contribute towards that. We, we, we collect their income. Um, and so, you know, you, you could argue that actually the interest that we do generate from the slight timing difference between receipt and payment contributes towards the admin costs. I mean, it's not as precise as that, but... That's an argument I'd put forward to make myself feel better. <laughs> I know why you're putting it forward, Graham. <laughs> but thank you very much. I think it's congratulations, really, despite the questions. Um, if only some of the London mothers could take a leaf out of our book. Uh, anybody else? Yes, Councillor. Thank you, Madam Chairman. I, I, I would like to return just for a few moments to H on page 50 and the relet in the quarter, second quarter of 52 days. The, there's a similar poor performance noted in Annex 1 on page 112 where the first Wessex houses take 60 days and Sentinel and English rural take 50 days each to relet vacant homes. This has seemed an inordinately long period. Is there any connection between the um, performance of these housing associations and our own performance here noted on H2? Yes, thank you, Chairman. I think I can. Well, in fact, it's interesting because actually both those housing associations, the two with the highest, have got direct labour organisations. So they've kept a bit like we have our contract with Mears. And um, that's maybe the reason that, that's their delay, because obviously they then pass their vacancies or they, they let us know about the properties that are available to let and then we let them through our allocation scheme and I'm also aware that some of the um, longer letting times or longer void periods are with their newer properties because they take they say they're ready to take handover and then they find out actually they're not ready to take handover and that's the point at which there's a delay so I hope that answers the question I'm going to put the recommendation uh, which is at the bottom of page unnumbered. Uh, it is recommended that the Corporate Overview and Scrutiny Committee considers the performance, etc. It's the bottom of that page, item 9. Is that agreed? agreed? Thank you. We move on to item 10, Treasury Management Activity. Peter, page 55 to 57 to 65. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, so this is a standard report that we bring um, just to update uh, members and committee on where we're at with our Treasury against our uh, prudential policy and Treasury management strategy. Um, so, so the good news is um, that <coughs> we're achieving 0.76% uh, uh, return. Uh, it, it doesn't sound phenomenal, but it's, you know, it's, it's a challenging amount to get in, and it's, it's good performance. Um, you, you can see from Annex 1 that the level of balances that we're dealing with is virtually running on par with last year. Um, so um, we're not building the reserves any, any more that we, we have done over the last few years. And uh, I, I recall Councillor Seabrook was asking about um, 
investing longer term. So I've included Annex 5 to show a projection of where our overall reserves are going over the next couple of years. And you can see that there's a, um, there's a plan to draw down reserves, um, which reflects spending patterns on our housing capital predominantly, uh, things like Oxford Bridge, the uh, huge spend that's going on there. Um, so we, we can see the, the balances are, are going down. So um, on page 59, other reserves, there's a, an explanation there of um, what the strategy is in terms of investing long. Um, the, the key point is the, in predominantly E, the, the additional margins that are achievable in the longer term. For example, one-year investment can, can be achieved at 1%, but two-year, it's very marginal increase at 1.2%. Um, Obviously, that affects our liquidity and, and also our risk um, looking further forward. So um, generally, we're, we're saying it, it at the moment also, it, it's not, at the moment, it's not really, we're not in a position to be looking much more than two years at the most, um, taking into account where the reserves are going uh, and also um, movement in interest rates so further down the line in another couple of years' time. So we don't particularly want to be locking in much further than that. Um, and that's pretty much what needs to be said on that, I think. Open to questions. Thank you. Any questions? Then can I say the report is noted? Thank you very much, Peter. Is that noted? Thank you very much indeed. Item 11, minutes of the meeting of the Housing Improvement Subcommittee, which you've all had. And you have no questions? Then that's agreed. Uh, is that agreed? Thank you. Uh, item 12, review of housing-related support services for vulnerable adults in Waverley. Jane Abrahams. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Um, this report uh, is obviously about the review of housing-related support services for vulnerable adults in Waverley. We currently provide support from a range of different teams across the housing service, and uh, support services available to customers seem to be very dependent upon their point of entry. So what we wanted to do was appoint some external expertise to review the services that we provide and to look at how we could provide a more streamlined and consistent service. So the report sets out the process that we went through and the review was completed in October with two overarching recommendations. So the first recommendation was for people over working age, older people, to be brought together into a single team. So that's the sheltered housing floating support service, that's the easy move service which helps people downsize and um, the aids and adaptations function that's part of our tenancy and estates team at the moment. Um, so the, the first recommendation is to bring those together as an actual team. Then the second recommendation is to have a team that supports people of working, of working age. And they're being brought together in what the uh, consultant has referred to as a virtual team. But what that actually means is line management structure will stay the same. And so those individuals, uh, like the, the, we have a Don't Lose Your Home project, that's a single person who's in the housing needs team. We have a welfare reform officer there in the rents team. We have specialist housing advice there within the housing options team. And we have, our, within the tenancy and, a support, um, tenancy and estate service, we have intervention officers who provide support. So it's bringing that group of people together to be able to decide uh, through a joint case management process how best to provide support to those individuals. So it's consistent. So everybody who comes to us who is a vulnerable adult in need of a service can be assessed through a single assessment process, a single risk assessment, and can be supported by a member of that team who works together in that kind of cross-cutting way. Um, what I think it also, the benefits of working that way is that some of those people who've in the past worked very much as individuals can have that professional support and have the opportunity to discuss what is the best support for individuals and hopefully it means we'll deliver a better service. In the short term, there's no change to any budget. It, we're working within exact, exactly the same budget with exactly the same members of staff. In the longer term, working in this way may deliver efficiencies, and obviously we'll bring those forward as they come. 
So that's really the summary. Thanks very much, Chairman. Thank you very Thank you. much, Jane. That's very much a good news story. I like the idea of the virtual team so that people aren't just on their own, but they have got support. Anybody got any queries? Any questions? Yes, sir. Thank you, Madam Chairman. I note on page 80, the first paragraph, there is a suggestion, I'm not quite clear, that we could um, charge for certain services. This, this sentence, there is scope, there is also scope to develop services which are paid for by the client. Does that imply that we don't charge at the moment? Could we? And what do you think tenants or residents' attitude to charges would be? Jane. At the moment, one of our, one of our services, Easy Move, we think has got potential to um, have an element of charging. So at the moment, we've piloted that for two years with funding from what's now the Better Care Fund, but which was the PPPF, per, um, Personal and prevention fund we piloted it with our tenants to encourage people to or help people to downsize and offering them practical support as well as financial support what we think we can do is we can offer that to owner occupiers so we have had some owner occupiers who've been in touch with us through our homeless route or through who are moving into sheltered accommodation from uh, private rented accommodation so what we're thinking is that actually there's some some opportunity to look at whether we can have that as a charged service so we run it for tenants without a charge, but that we run it for other tenures with a charge. Thank you. It looks as though it could go on the list. <laughs> so you're compiling your list already? Excellent. If there are no more questions, Jane, thank you. That really was a good report on that. Um, so I put the recommendation, which is corporate overview and scrutiny, comments, and we've done that, and recommendations of the review of housing-related support services. Is that agreed? Thank you. Item 13, Esther Lyons. Review of housing associations operating in Waverley. 95 to 120. Right, Esther, off you go. Thank you, Chairman. Um, this is a report that we've prepared to inform members of the performance of some of the major local housing associations. And it came about after a request from a couple of members who'd been dealing with specific queries with, from housing association tenants in their own ward who wanted a bit more information about the performance and how these associations compare with each other. And um, so we've put together a survey which was carried out for us by Surrey Community Action this summer on a range of indicators um, on repairs, the way complaints are dealt with, also... Um, support for vulnerable tenants and antisocial behaviour as well. And what the survey showed was that there, you know, there are differences between them, but there are specific issues which seem to be a problem for all of the housing associations. And antisocial behaviour is one of those. And also finding the point of contact for the customer at that housing association seemed to be a problem for some of them. Um, so we feel, as offices at Waverley, um, that it's important that we take an interest in the housing association activity because housing association stock is a third of our social housing stock and we know that members as well will have residents in their own wards who are housing association tenants so it really is important that these tenants of affordable housing are getting the same offer whether they're a Waverley tenant or a housing association tenant in terms of the way that their tenancy is managed and the service they get from their landlord so we have taken on board the findings of the survey but what we've also done this year is set up a program of meetings with each housing association individually to discuss any problems and to discuss things that can't be dealt with in a wider forum and um, for example individual cases of antisocial behavior or complaints as well and I'm happy to take any comments or questions one of the suggestions that I've given in the report is perhaps that one of the housing associations could come and speak to the committee in future if that would be of interest to members. Otherwise, happy to take any other suggestions on ways in which you might like to monitor performance going forward or any more information you'd like from us. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Esther. Councillor Short. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Really, I'll be careful not to identify it, although 
press has already done so, but you might get some talking about Hindhead. Um, I'm very disappointed with the anti-social uh, behaviour. Um, I, I honestly find the housing associations are simply not robust enough. I was away in uh, June when my colleague uh, dealt with one particular case, uh, and I'm sure he'll speak in a moment, but as far as I was concerned, nothing came together. It was a problem that had been going on for a number of years. The Housing Association wanted to keep it under the carpet, and it was simply not a robust performance by any of the organizations that should have leapt in there to help. And I'm particularly uh, disappointed with what we, Waverley, did. And the idea that's just been put forward that some of the housing associations should come and speak to this committee, I totally support because I was not happy in this year earlier on. And I'm sure others will make similar comments. Thank you, Councillor. Anybody else? Councillor Goodridge. Can I say how useful this report is? Mm. Um, and to thank you for it, because maybe in a year or whenever it's time, we, we might have another report and we can see how improvements... We need to know the base, basically, and... and, and um, Councillor Isherwood has pointed out one, one factor which shows disappointing information. And um, it's very useful to see how one as housing association is faring against another. Uh, and with that information, we can then have a bit of an input to see if we can um, increase all the housing association to a better level. Um, so I, I would just like to congratulate the officers on the initiative of getting mm. this done. Um, which I think is very helpful um, and, and gives us something to, to debate and discuss and, if necessary, bring in housing officers from these housing associations on particular matters which we're, where we want improvement. After all, they are housing people in the borough um, on our behalf, in effect, mm. and we ought to have a, a keen interest on how they're performing. So thank you for the report. Well, a lot of them are housing our tenants, and therefore we do need to actually, I think we might do some kind of scrutiny on this one, as we have done with others, and where we have particular items we really want to, like antisocial behaviour, that we do ask for their policy, what they do, and how robust they are. Councillor Siebel. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, picking up on uh, the point Councillor Goodrich made and also a um, the theme that was touched on earlier, I note from figure 10 in the report on page 112 of our, our pack that the housing associations are challenged with a wide variety of relet times in the same way that Waverley suffers from a, a wide range of void relet outcomes. What does stand out in that figure, though, is that the Thames Valley Housing Association, which has the second largest stock of association properties in the borough has an average relet time of less than 10 days. Uh, so I'd like to suggest that uh, there is an opportunity here for both Waverley and possibly the other housing associations to invite Thames Valley to share what they're doing right to uh, attain such a significantly better performance in keeping properties occupied, uh, unless of course the officers already understand why Thames Valley has such a low relet time. Um, otherwise perhaps an assessment of their success factors could be added to the next steps on page 120 of our pack. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you. Don't lose these papers because they may be valuable in asking your questions when we get them in. Councillor Hess. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Um, I'd really like, just like to amplify what uh, Councillor Goodrich has said about having established a really useful baseline. I mean, it's slightly surprising that um, we didn't have this sort of oversight before, but it makes the fact that it's been done now all the more important. Um, I notice there are some, some next steps, um, but could you just make it absolutely clear for, for the committee that uh, the council's objective is to come up with um, concrete objectives and 
a collective view or your view from the centre, as it were, looking out at all the different associations, of what options might be pursued in order to meet the objectives that you develop. Because that's where the council can really add value to all the separate organisations which are presumably trying to do their best out there, but you can give them that, uh, that, that um, overview of, of what best practice looks like and what, um, you know, what objectives they need to be heading to. Thank you. Thank, somebody? You. Thank you, Chairman. Could I, could I make a comment on that? Um, yeah, I think we have to be clear. We don't regulate the housing associations. They've got the Homes and Communities Agency who will regulate them on their performance, but we do have a good working relationship with them, and in some ways, you know, we rely on them for new development. They will be taking on lots of the large planning developments that are coming through the planning system to deliver the affordable housing on those, and also that... You know, we're, we're nominating our tenants to them. They're relying on us for services. So it's, it would be in both sides' interest to carry on, I think, getting to know what works well so that we can perhaps learn from what they're doing well and hopefully they can come to committee and hear some of your ideas as well. So I think any ideas that you've got on how we might be able to improve, we can certainly pass on to them. And we've got a role in cascading government policy and information to them anyway. We do an annual housing association forum across Surrey that I'm involved with as well. So any of your ideas, we can happily feed back to them. Thank you. I just add a closing comment. First of all, thanks very much. What I would say with respect to the, the problem that we had in Hindhead, um, there seems to be um, considerable scope to, to up the game of the, the parties that are involved in this. And there's, there are some pretty fundamental issues simply about how they coordinate their activities and how they exchange information. And anything we can do to provide a wider perspective, um, I think would be, should be welcomed by them. All the people that I spoke with and dealt with were very willing, were trying to do the right thing, but were simply not succeeding. So any assistance um, should be uh, absolutely lapped up by them, as you're probably already finding, I would hope. Thank you. Thank you, members. Yes, Councillor Blackton. Hand up to speak, Councillor. Yes. Thank you very much. Um, the thing that is worrying me is that we have one particular area where there is a lot of intermingling between housing apart. This is called the chantries um, that may be uh, well known to you because it's also uh, an area where we have the greatest degree of, I think I might say, problems. <clears throat> and um, part of it is also affected but to a less extent by the fact that the housing, um, it, <clears throat> where it's, there is a housing organisation that deals with it, there's a bit more control. But there's an awful lot of other bits and pieces that are not under any seeming control, and that needs, as far as I am concerned, some coordination, and I'd be only too willing to try and be involved with the coordination of, of that organisation. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Thank you, Councillor Blackdown. We're not actually talking about the mix of the estates. We're actually talking about roles of housing associations that we know about. And is there anybody else wanting to speak before I put a proposal? Councillor. Thank you, Madam Chairman. It's ju just really an observation. I'd like to say as a fresher, um, this there was a very refreshing report. It's, uh, it's given me... Quite, quite a lot of insight to what's happening here at, at Waverley. And to, to know that we have seven housing associations from the, from the, 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 the south of England, and obviously uh, they, um, all associations are going to have a, a, a different approach as to, to, to what Waverley wants. And I, th I think it's, it's really important that um, this report has come to us and, and flagged up some, some failings here. And I, I'm, I'm hopeful that we, you can move on these issues. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Although, as stated, we don't regulate these housing associations, perhaps we have some influence over them. Good. 
because, in fact, there are an awful lot of housing associations, although most of them are not listed here. Some of them must be very small. This doesn't make sense, because there must be an optimum size for a housing association. If it's too big, it'll be bureaucratic. If it's too small, it won't have the specialists to answer questions. Can we not influence them in some way to combine, sell properties to each other, exchange? They're doing themselves a disservice we, by being too small. We can, we can actually influence, because they need our land. We need them to build. We give them our tenants. We, you know, we actually look at our list and we put people there. Um, but they are businesses, and how they run their businesses, their business, is not down to us. But we can actually influence in the way that we can say to them, "Well, we're not happy with the way that you run this particular side of your business, and we would suggest that." And that is all we can do. It's a bit like with mirrors. We go as far as we can to tell them what they can and can't do. Um, <clears throat> but I think it would be a good idea if we were able to have housing associations, not necessarily all of them, but we can pick and choose. I mean, I know an excellent housing association we have, which is quite small, is the Rural Housing Association. Um, but we can have them in, we can scrutinize them in the way, because it's our tenants we want to make sure that the people that we put in there receive the right treatment. Yes, Anne. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Um, I presume, I might be wrong, that we have preferred housing associations that we deal with, and when land has to have, you know, 30, 40% affordable, is it up, not up to us to choose which housing association is part of that development? Um, certainly in the previous authority, not that we had any council houses, but it was all housing associations. And the panel that I was on every year scrutinised the associations, and some fell off, and they weren't allowed to even be the, the next ones or the new ones. Some went to the top, and they were the ones that were then the partners in that development. Um, and, I mean, there was a lot of bidding from them. You say it's big business. You know, and when one of the big ones had a very bad year and they were not allocated any affordable housing in the next, you know, big sites, there was quite a little rumpus. So they had to pull their socks up because otherwise they don't get them. So is it up to us to allocate the housing association on development sites? Jane? Thank you very much, Chairman. On the two points, firstly, in relation to Councillor Bolton's point about the fact that actually a number of our housing associations are now looking to merge because the government reforms around the 1% rent reduction, around extended right to buy, have meant they've had to review their business plans. And actually, I think we went to a, um, an event that First Wessex put on last week that the view is very much that the bigger ones will get a lot bigger and a lot of the smaller ones may sadly be swallowed up because, as Councillor Frost said, there are some very good local providers in terms of specialisms around rural housing, which it would be a shame to lose. So that's on that point. In terms of having a list of preferred registered providers, in the past, local authorities did have that and felt they had got some influence. But in fact, now the, a lot of the control effectively is down to that, the developers. So they're the ones that get the planning permissions. They ask us who we prefer to work with because obviously they want to have a good relationship with us and we tell them who we work with and who we would like them to work with. But actually it comes down to which of the housing associations is going to offer them the best deal. And in the current climate, again, with the rent reductions and with all the other pressures that are on them, some of them aren't even developing anymore. Some of them are being very careful about the areas where they do develop and where they don't. So we have an influencing role, absolutely, but it's, it's a more limited role than perhaps it was even five or six years ago. put the recommendation which is at the bottom of item 13 but thank you very much and what we'll do we will actually invite the housing associations in so that not all necessarily all of them so that we can scrutinize their activities and what they do and what they provide so i hope you all agree with that thank you item 14 budget issues peter Thank you, Chairman. Uh, budget issues. This is a, um, a scene-setting report uh, for members, especially new members, just to um, 
just set out where what we're going into in terms of um, the budget for general fund and for the uh, housing account um, for the next four years and um, and also for more specifically next year's budget um, so on the general fund we have the um, the, the seminar on 5th of October, members are invited to attend. We set out the scene then in quite some significant detail. Um, and we saw then on the general fund that we had a, um, over the next um, four years, we've got a £3.3 .3 million deficit to, to deal with. Um, and you can see in paragraph six the shortfall there, um, how it builds up over the uh, course of the four years. Um, so we've got some savings to find on, on, on the general fund. And um, you know, we've, we have got strategies in place to deal with that. And so um, paragraph 7 just has a brief um, explanation there that um, we've, we have got some measures. We've got Star Chamber, which we've just um, finished going through it today. I was the, uh, the last one to um, present my services. Uh, we've got Member Challenge uh, through this committee and the committee processes in general. Um, and we've got investor save opportunities to um, try to resolve the situation. So eight and nine describes what this our chamber process is all about and the kind of things we're looking at. And at the very bottom of nine, you can see that um, there's four um, bullet points there. And, and the income generation is very firmly um, on the scene for what we were discussing earlier on. And, and also about efficiencies um, and looking at service challenges. Um, so the, the, the scrutiny committees will um, get a lot of detail on the budget in January and that's the opportunity to put some challenge in place then as, uh, from this committee's point of view of what's going on within the budgets and make recommendations to um, executive. On the housing side, there's this coming year on the housing side from the July Chancellor's um, emergency budget, there's been some significant changes. There's no um, new news to people here, I'm, I'm sure. But, um, over the next um, four years, we've got the 1% reduction on year on year on the rents. Um, so Waverley, potentially, as you can see in the report, will be losing £300 million. Pounds. We've got the sale of the high-value voids, and we've got welfare reform. It's all impacting on the housing revenue account. So there's some significant challenge coming through um, f where previous years um, we, we had a, a, f a very robust plan and we were very buoyant and we were looking at investing. So you know, the, the scene's changing now and we're responding to that. And that, that's where this report's describing how we're getting to that. So um, we've got the budget timetable, paragraph 16, just gives you the um, high level. This is all the key points of where we're reporting budget and how the scrutiny is going to happen. Um, leading up to uh, February Council, the Budget Setting Council on 16th of February. Um, so it, the, the point of bringing it here is just so that the, the committee has a chance to comment at this point in the budget cycle as to where things are at. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Members. Any observations? Yes, Councillor. <coughs> Thank you, Madam Chairman. I accept that... Uh, Thing, life is uncertain, but two points on the projected shortfall would seem to be particularly uncertain. One is the triennial pension review, which of course we don't know until the spring. But the other is the revenue support grant, which you're projecting doesn't increase further in the fourth year. Is that not a bit heroic? Because the government seems to be cutting back every year. In other words, our grant will be reduced every year. Ch Chairman, uh, can I? Yeah, if I, if, I, if I pick those two up. Uh, on the revenue support grant, our uh, revenue support grant is currently um, uh, 1.7 million. And so we're expecting it to be extinguished over three years. And um, in fact, we were making those um, assumptions before um, the government confirmed it recently. But uh, so, um, yes, yeah, so, that, so that, that's, that's why it, it doesn't. It, it's, um, I, can, I can understand the confusion in the presentation. This is a cumulative sort of reduction. But it, what it doesn't say is what it starts from. And it starts from 1.7 million. On the triennial pension review, um, 
Yes, com completely take the point that um, it's uncertain. Um, I went to the uh, AGM of our pension uh, fund last uh, Friday, and we heard from the act actuary there who will start to do their work, assessment work now. Um, and um, one of the senior um, pension officers came to speak to the audit committee last week as well, um, because the audit committee look at our accounts. Um, now, what they will look at is um, their assessment of longevity of, of pension pensioners within the pension and future pensioners, um, and also at investment performance and discount rates, etc. A whole a whole range of factors. Um, the, the only sort of saving grace in terms of um, uh, the volatility of this figure is that we do have a smoothing mechanism built into the um, pension fund calculation. And so 200,000 um, additional is our best estimate at this time. Um, I, I would imagine it would be in, it will be in that region when we get the final figures in, but I can only say that because there is a smoothing mechanism that uh, gives a, a greater degree of certainty than you would normally get from an actuary. Just say to members that um, local government accounting uh, is is quite interesting. If you think you've been an accountant in real life, forget it, because when you're actually applying it to local government accounts and local government accounting, it is totally different, uh, and it does take a while to get the hang of all this. So it, what I'm and I'm, they're going to hate me over here. What I'm offering members, if any of you feel you would like just to brush up, uh, you've had the finance seminar, but if you would like an extra bit of training, so to speak, on this, in this area, please do let Fiona know, and I'm sure we can organise it, so that when we come into the real budgeting process, when you've got figures before you in a form you've never thought you'd see again, um, you can actually work your way through them. Is that all right? gentlemen because uh, I do want members to be able to understand as far as possible what they're making their decisions on anything else thank yes. you madam chairman but I would like to compliment the finance people on their excellent presentation of the information they are very good but you will have this batch of paperwork like that that you've got to work your way through uh, and it's not easy uh, those of us who've been around a long time still don't find it terribly easy. Um, so thank you. Any questions? Uh, uh, thank you, Madam Chair. The, uh, I've virtually not got a question at all, except for the fact that I need to ask a lot of smaller questions to the members that are sitting um, who I have no doubt whatsoever uh, will inform me of what I need to know, because it must be pretty obvious both to, your, um, to them and as it is to me that I don't know enough about what I'm talking about. I'd be grateful for a bit of tuition if I can get it. Thank you. Certainly. We can for you, Councillor Bagdam. Some tuition. You can ask your questions on a one-to-one -one basis. Is that all right? Thank you very much indeed. I'd like to state roughly where my main areas of ignorance are, and maybe somebody can do something about it. Thanks. National Non-Domestic Rates Discretionary Rate Relief Policy. Peter. Thank you, Chairman. Um, so the, the um, discretionary rates relief policy is, is entirely to do with business rates. Um, the government has a national uh, scheme of um, rate relief. They call it mandatory relief. And you can see that in, in paragraph 1, page 128. Um, which describes what reliefs the government's willing to give. Um, over on the top of that, you can see in paragraphs two and three that we have some um, legislation that allows us to give discretionary rate relief to um, willing causes, but it has to be in the interests of the council taxpayers overall. Um, so paragraph four, we can see the discretionary rate relief 
guidance that we we've been employing for the last four years at uh, Waverley, and we refresh this policy on on a four yearly basis. So it, it's with the um, the election cycle. Um, so we can see paragraph four gives us four different categories of rate discretionary rate relief that um, we've been working to, and we've reviewed these in terms of. Um, are they applicable and is there a reason to change them um, and if you go forward through to paragraph 7 you can see there's three options around the review that we've done so we're saying option A is to continue the current policy and, and consider new requests for discretionary relief um, on a case by case basis or we could withdraw some categories uh, of the existing discretionary rate relief policy, and um, you know, there's always a possibility we, we may choose to do that. Um, we have to have reasons to do so. Um, or C, um, we could withdraw the 20% top-up to mandatory relief, and th that would create a small saving of 13000 for us. However, to do any of these, we have to consider paragraph 8 which says in, in considering options members are asked to consider the following factors um, so in whatever we do we have to have that consideration um, th there's an appeals process for um, people, uh, businesses that have um, requested man uh, discretionary rate relief and for whatever reasons haven't received it and so we're describing here what the appeal process is so in conclusion there's there's a recommendation there's five recommendations and the recommendation is that we stay with the current scheme as it is it's it's proven to be working for us there are uh, some appendices there that that um, list some uh, specific um, businesses that are receiving our uh, discretionary rate relief and um, the recommendation is we stay with them. Just point out a couple of things on uh, on this. So um, on Annex 1, you can see uh, point 7, this, uh, point 7B, there's some writing in bold. Just to point out, there's no actual change to that, uh, to the document itself. I think it was just put in bold originally because it was just highlighting to youth and sports clubs that if they're, they're, they are requesting this rate relief that they have to observe the, the liquor licence requirement. Um, Annex 2... Just a, a small uh, typo in Annex 2 on page 135, um, categories 2 and 3, the 80% and the 50% reliefs actually belong in the right-hand column, the discretionary, not the mandatory. So uh, I'm just open to comment on this one. Thank you very much indeed, Peter. Any comments? As I say, the, the policy has stood, up the test of, stood the test of time over the years. So, Councillor Isherwood. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Just on page 135, when I look at category 3, Boots UK Limited. I just wonder why they get a discretionary relief. It seems a national company. Councillor, can I remind you, we are discussing the policy, not the individual items. I'm sure officers will answer your question. Okay. It's because under your policy, it's the only chemist in a rural settlement. Ch Chairman, that, that's absolutely correct. On, on page 128.4, um, explains about the rural settlement. And actually, the, the relief is given with regard to the premises rather than the owner of the premises necessarily. So it, it meets with the criteria set out in point four um, and therefore qualifies. In which case, can I put the recommendation at the bottom of item 15? Is that agreed? I have no items under uh, the motion set out in my name, item 16, and therefore, or item 17, I declare the meeting closed.